A first reading from Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 to 33. In the sixth month, the Abel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give, God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. A second reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while we were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. This is the word of the Lord. A very blessed Christmas to all of you gathered here. Let's give another round of applause to the wonderful choir, uh, our dancers as well. We want to praise the Lord for every one of them. They worked very hard uh, for this cantata, A Promise Kept. Let's come to the Lord in prayer today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came into this world. Thank you that you were obedient to the will of the Father. Thank you, Father God, for truly keeping your promises. Be with us, Lord, as we come to your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. title for today's message is God's Promise Kept in Giving Us Jesus. How many of you think that um, making a promise is dangerous? Put up your hands. How about that side? Anyone says that keeping a promise is dangerous? Indeed it is, and sometimes uh, couples uh, hesitate to get married because they know that marriage is a commitment, there are promises and pledges that are made. Pastors are also very afraid of making promises. For example, if the uh, church member says, can you come and visit me, pray for me, 
serve me Holy Communion. Um, nowadays, I'm a bit careful uh, what I say. Now, the reason is because there's a lot of work to be done, and so that promise may not be kept. In fact, for a church the size of KL Wesley, we probably need about four pastors in the English congregation. But unfortunately, our annual conference is very, very short of pastors. But God kept His promise in giving us Jesus. And God will keep all the future promises that He has made for us. And we can be very sure of this. Particularly the great and glorious second coming of Jesus. So in today's world, we ask that question, how much of Christmas celebrations have to do with God's promise kept for us? How much of it has to do with the birth of Jesus and the message behind the birth of Jesus? Our church is very good in decorations. You can see all the beautiful decorations uh, at the backdrop here. Uh, different locations in church, you can see Christmas trees as well. And I wonder when we go to the shopping malls, uh, what are the decorations that we see? I want to say that in the last 10, 20 years, shopping malls have really gone all the way to decorate uh, their, especially the open space with huge Christmas trees and decorations. And somehow our society portrays the fact that what is important during Christmas is the Christmas tree and the decorations. And for some of you who are coming to church tomorrow, the one pound that you will receive after service is over. We have westernized Christmas, except for the pound that is not westernized. I remember in my student days in Australia, um, the musics were coming from the shops during Christmas time. And I remember this particular day where the temperature was more than 35 degrees Celsius. And blaring from these shops were songs like, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. I'm wondering, dream on, you won't get a white Christmas in Australia. Yet we are fascinated by all this. If you go to Facebook and Instagram, what kind of advertisements you see for Christmas? Roast turkey, roast beef, all the delicious Western food. And um, this year I see a lot of roast turkey advertisements. Uh, last year I heard there was some trouble in getting the turkeys. So my dear friends, what is really important? Where is Jesus in Christmas? Where are Joseph and Mary? How many of you have been to shopping malls where you actually see a nativity scene, even if it's made out of cardboard or wooden uh, uh, figures? How many of you have seen in our Malaysian shopping malls a nativity scene? Right, I thought maybe one or two shopping malls may have it. But it looks like they have missed out on the shepherds, the wise men, etc. So my first main point for today is there's something special about Jesus' birth, and that is God sent us His Son. Now this is where churches step in. This is where our church today presents the message of Christmas uh, by Cantata. And we have all the special services, including our candlelight service at 6.30 today and our Christmas Day service at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And we, the church, need to proclaim that message that God sent us His Son on that first Christmas. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In the month of December, I was involved in the services of four people who passed away. 
Now, this is a lot of uh, people who passed away in December, including yesterday, and that person is not our church member, it's a former church member of mine. And somehow, if I'm leading the wake service or the funeral service, I will end up with this final song. Anyone can guess what the final song is, except my wife? The answer is, Because He Lives. And I believe it's a wonderful song to, to end the service. It is a song of hope. It is a song that victory is won when a person passes away. And the beginning verse says, God sent His Son. They call Him Jesus. In the Old Testament, we see that uh, God revealed Himself as the Holy Spirit or God, uh, the Spirit of God. We find that God revealed Himself in the various names of God that we are familiar with. But the person of Jesus Christ is only revealed in New Testament times. Although there are prophecies of His entry into the world, messianic passages, for example, Psalm 2, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. In the New Testament, we see very clearly that God sent His Son into the world, fully human and fully divine. Just now, there's a wonderful song that was sung, Welcome to Our World. And that is a beautiful introduction to who Jesus is, that we truly welcome Him into our world. Luke, as we look at the passages today, carefully observed Jesus' life on earth and wrote an orderly account to Theophilus. And then Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, Luke says that you will know with certainty the things that have been taught to you about Jesus. Now Luke is wonderful. He writes a two-volume piece in Scripture that came into Scripture, Luke and Acts. Jesus is more than a history lesson for Theophilus. Jesus is indeed the promised Messiah, the promised King that, that God has sent into the world. And thus Luke was very fascinated by the supernatural events that took place around the life of Jesus. Firstly, for Christmas, we celebrate the virgin birth. We also see angels in the Christmas narrative, as well as in the book of Acts. And Luke was very fascinated by these heavenly messengers. We also find that Luke records the miracles of Jesus and so, for example, in Luke chapter 7, we find that uh, Jesus heals the centurion's servant. And if you go back and look at that passage, uh, Jesus was notified that the centurion's servant was very ill. And he was moving towards the centurion's house. But then messengers came out and said, the centurion has a word for you, Jesus. He says that you are so good paraphrasing, I am not even worthy to have you in my house. But just say the word and I know that my servant will be healed because I am a man who is a commander. I say go and people go. I say come and they come. And by this he recognized Jesus' supernatural authority to heal. And Jesus was taken up by his faith in fact, the scripture records that uh, when they went back, they found that the servant had already been healed. In the very next story, in Luke chapter 7, we find that Jesus heals the widow's son. And the Bible makes it very clear that this son had already died. And yet Jesus was able to resurrect him from the dead. But the greatest of all supernatural action is the fact that Jesus himself rose from the dead. Even in the miracles of Jesus, we may say that in the Old Testament, we have Elijah, Elisha, they were able to perform miracles. But here we find the greatest miracle. 
that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And, and so Luke has to investigate. Luke has to write the facts for Theophilus. And, and so to say whether these are true or these are false. In today's world, we have strong atheists. For example, like Dr. David Wood, Dr. Josh McDowell, who truly disclaimed the facts of the Bible, but they studied the evidence and then they came to the logical conclusion that indeed Jesus is the Christ and the Lord. Luke was a good physician, a doctor who examines the facts of Jesus' life thoroughly. Let me emphasize the word thoroughly. He was so thorough that he even covered material that the other uh, gospel writers did not, or at least Matthew did not. He covered the angel Gabriel coming to Zechariah. He covered uh, the birth of John the Baptist, not just in passing, but the events leading up to his birth. He covered the fact that the angel Gabriel came to Mary and had a dialogue with her. He was a good physician, and all good physicians have the best interests of the patient to find out the root cause. The highest motivation of a good physician or a doctor today is the best interest of the patient and wanting to cure the patient uh, rather than see an accumulation in his bank account. These are doctors of integrity. And how do we know that Luke is a physician? Well, I looked back at uh, Luke's, uh, Luke's Gospel and Acts. I couldn't find Luke was a physician. Anybody knows how we know that Luke was a physician in the Bible? Well, it's there in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Paul says that Luke is the good physician. So Luke, uh, as a good physician, was able to examine uh, the events around the life of Jesus. For example, Angel Gabriel said to Mary, His name is to be called Jesus, and He will be called Son of the Most High God. Now, I wonder when you read Scripture and you read phrases like this, Son of the Most High God, it's, it's unusual. Son of God, yes, we come across it. But Son of the Most High and um, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 14, uh, verses 18 to 20, and then in verse 22, it talks about King Melchizedek. And it's mentioned that he is a priest of the Most High God, El Elyon. And in that story, we find Abram actually paying a tithe to him. And this priest and king offering him bread and wine, foreshadowing the coming of Jesus in the book of Psalms 110, verse 1, we find that the Bible says, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And I'm sure that those people who do not know the New Testament will not understand this verse unless we go to the book of Hebrews that elaborates that Jesus belongs to a different priesthood, the one after the order of Melchizedek. And the angel Gabriel says his name is to be called Jesus. Yeshua in Aramaic, the original Hebrew word would be Joshua. And the meaning of this is that he saves or God saves. Now Luke is clever. He's acting like a reporter. He's recording history. And he knows that he needs to get accounts from first-hand eyewitnesses. Who better for Luke to talk to than Jesus' mother, Mary? Firstborn, Jesus. The scriptures make it very clear. Okay, how many of you are mothers here? How many of you remember the events that took place surrounding your very first child coming into this world? Put up your hands. Okay, how many of you too shy to put up your hands, put up your hands? 
Right. So he went and talked, I'm sure he went and talked to Mary. Now in my life, I have some significant ladies. Of course, my wife is the first, uh, my sister, and my mother. And in her heydays, in the 1970s, I know that her memory was superb. She could memorize all the phone numbers of her friends, and that were a lot of friends. And in those days, we did not have all these devices where we can store numbers and click the name and immediately the phone number comes up. Yes, first century Palestine. Memories were superb. No television, no radio, no smartphone, no internet. They remembered facts brilliantly. And Mary remembered every word that the angel Gabriel had uttered to her and her dialogue with the angel Gabriel. In fact, in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible records that Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. Secondly, there's something special about Jesus' life. Jesus fulfilled God's mission for saving humanity by his death and resurrection. Now, it's interesting in the Gospels of Mark and John, they do not record the birth narratives of Jesus. They go straight into his adult life. But we thank Matthew and Luke for taking the trouble to record the birth narratives for us. More important than the birth narratives, in a sense, was God's mission upon Jesus. And all four Gospels record this. If Jesus were merely a human being and not divine, his story would be no better than Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, or Genghis Khan. But God sent Jesus into this world, giving him a one-way trip to the cruel cross of Calvary because the Messiah must die first before he rises again. And that is the only way to save the world. The only way. An angel of the Lord told the shepherds, as recorded in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, who were in the fields, For unto you this day in the city of David is born a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. It began with one angel's proclamation to the shepherds. And then the Bible says, A great multitude of angels began by praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom God is pleased. Now, during the MCO, which we try to forget because we all were under very uh, restricted um, conditions and circumstances, we had to have live streaming. I remember when I first came to church in January 2021, within about 12 days, the government imposed another MCO. And in those days, only about 15 people can come to church. And the 15 people are actually the worship leader, the musician, the preacher, etc. And many of you remember live streaming. It was like a live telecast of the service that was going on. But today we have gone to recordings on YouTube. Now for an ordinary Sunday, we have two services, 9 and 5 p.m. in the evening, and the preacher preaches the same sermon. So what happens for myself is Around one o'clock, when the recordings are made available and I'm free, I will go and hear my sermon. The reason I go and hear my sermon is because I want to hear all the mistakes I make, all the boo-boo, mispronunciation of word, and sometimes very chong hey, uh, so that one can cut short a bit for the 5 p.m. service. Sometimes, uh, you know, the meaning does not come across very clearly, uh, usually in the past, before YouTube, my wife will tell me all this. Lah. But now with YouTube, it's very accurate. You can see yourself and you can hear all the words that you're uttering. 
Now, for the shepherds, there was no YouTube and internet, etc. But they compared notes with one another. And so they were able to remember the words of the angel that declared the Saviour being born, who is Christ the Lord. <clears throat> born a Saviour, promises kept by God. Christ the Lord, promises kept by God in sending us the Messiah. No ordinary baby because he was on a rescue mission for humanity. Next, we find that Luke well documented Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in Luke chapters 23 and 24. Every Good Friday in church, I, I think so for some time, we have been looking at the seven words uh, from the cross. And three of these words or quotations actually come from Luke's gospel. Firstly, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Number two, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And number three, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. At the burial of Jesus, we find this person called Joseph of Arimathea. Now, other Gospels also mention his name. Uh, he's a member of the Jewish Supreme Council. But only in Luke's Gospel is it mentioned that he was a good and righteous man who had not consented to the decision and action of the Sanhedrin. He was one man who stood apart from that decision of the Sanhedrin that wanted to see Jesus being punished to death. Integrity is important for leaders, not just Joseph of Arimathea, but for all leaders today. And I say this is because we serve in the church board. And members of the church board need to have integrity within them. We may have the batch pastor like myself, LCC chairman, lay leader, PPRC chairman. But the batch itself does not guarantee integrity. Integrity is seen when our heart is surrendered to the Lord, fully surrendered. And that is why, my dear friends, if we do experience leaders lacking integrity, we need to pray and ask God, God, change their hearts. May they be repentant and turn to you once again. Luke also recorded the events on the road to Emmaus and the ascension of Jesus. And it's only Luke who records the ascension of Jesus in Luke chapter 24 and in Acts chapter 1. Jesus attested that God's promises were fulfilled in the Scriptures. It is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise again, that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations. Luke 24 45 to 47. You know, in that passage, is a post-resurrection passage. Jesus appears to the 11 and a few others. And Jesus actually gives them a, a summarized lesson of the Old Testament. And he's telling them that this Old Testament was written about me and about my mission to save the world. And the Bible records there in Luke chapter 24, Jesus opened up their minds. He cleared all the blockages for them to clearly see. Suffering, death, and resurrection, inexorably interconnected with one another to see the salvation of the world and the gospel being proclaim. Finally, there's something special, not just about Jesus' birth, not just about Jesus' life, 
but also about us, something really special. We know the Christmas song, Go tell it on the mountains, over the hills and everywhere, that Jesus Christ is born. And so in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we know that Christ has commanded us to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Peter, John, Philip took this very, very seriously. That's why they did not fear imprisonment. They were willing to continue to share with boldness the gospel of Jesus Christ. And finally, we see the Apostle Paul doing likewise. So what about us? Are we witness bearers of the risen Christ? God kept his part of the deal in saving us through Jesus Christ. Will we keep our part of the deal? And that is to be witnesses of Christ, to proclaim that Christ lives forever. At this time, we close our eyes. We want to come to the Lord today. For those who have never given your life to Jesus, and what the Bible says to believe in Jesus, and you want to do so. And for those of us who brought our friends and relatives who do not know Jesus Christ, uh, please also be alert at this time. So is there anyone here who would like to surrender your life to Jesus today. Now we close our eyes at this time. And if there's anyone, uh, could you raise your hand so that I can pray for you today? Okay, we just pause for a while. Is there anybody who would like to surrender their life to Jesus? Come, let's pray at this time. And Lord, for those who want to surrender their life to you, we want to pray for them that they will make a commitment to you. And for those of us who are church members here, we brought our friends and relatives. Lord, we pray too that we will continue to follow through with them this day. Let me just say one more thing now. God kept his part of the deal in saving us through Jesus Christ. Will we keep our part of the deal? And that is to proclaim Christ. And this morning, I want to pray for all of us. I believe the majority of us here are Christians. I want to pray and ask God that we will keep our part of the deal. Lord, we come before you today. Lord, we recognize that we are enamored by the festivities of Christmas, and sometimes we are so absorbed by it, and then we forget it is all about Jesus and all about the Savior coming to the world, fulfilling the mission of death and resurrection, and now giving us a call to be His witnesses. Today, Lord, I want to pray for all of us that in our hearts, we know this theoretically. But Lord, sometimes it's so difficult to translate what is in our head right down to our hearts. And so today, Lord, we just pray for courage, Lord, and ask that your people here, including myself, will take the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ seriously. And Lord, for those of us who are older in age, we find it difficult. We ask you, Lord, that you help us to pray for our friends who do not know you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, engage in activities that build relationship with them. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.